My mother-in-law stole my chemo medication, convinced it was poison, now we're battling not just cancer but also her relentless harassment and family chaos. I, a 31-year-old man named David, am currently dealing with numerous issues, with Diana being the most problematic. This is compounded by the fact that I am battling cancer for the second time in my life. My first diagnosis came when I was 15. I fought bravely and managed to overcome it. Life was calm and peaceful until recently when a routine health check for my job turned my world upside down. At 31, I found myself facing cancer again. This time it was rectal cancer, entirely unrelated to my previous illness. Though it is only at stage 2, my oncologist Dr. Anderson warned me of its aggressive nature, emphasizing the need for swift action to prevent it from escalating to stage 3 or beyond. The news was a crushing blow, as it felt like a relentless force was determined to see me defeated. Anyone who has faced cancer or known someone who has, understands the immense physical and emotional toll it takes. After undergoing surgery, I was set to begin chemotherapy. The doctors prescribed oral chemo, which I could take at home, requiring hospital visits only for periodic blood tests and scans. This arrangement was a relief, as daily hospital visits would have been too taxing. I am currently on sick leave from work, and the treatment has left me significantly weakened and noticeably thinner. Before this, my wife Emily and I shared household chores equally. Nowadays my energy levels are all over the place, with some days being better than others. However, immediately after each chemo session, even the simplest tasks become overwhelming. Despite my efforts to contribute, Emily has been incredibly understanding, reassuring me that my sole focus should be on my recovery. One afternoon Diana visited, fully aware of my diagnosis. I was lounging on the couch trying to rest while Emily was doing household tasks. Diana approached me with a distasteful look, exclaiming, look at you lounging around as if you are on vacation. Are not you ashamed? A grown man lying down in the middle of the day while your poor wife works like a slave. I explained to her how I just had chemo and was not fit to do any work. She scoffed at me and said, you cannot cure yourself with those toxic chemicals, only natural products work. Later Diana cornered Emily in the kitchen. Though I did not intend to eavesdrop, I could not help but overhear their conversation. Diana ranted, you should not let him take that poison, it is killing him. If it was not toxic, he would not feel so awful. Doctors today are clueless, you need to try herbal treatments instead. Emily, recognizing Diana's ignorance, quickly shut her down, warning her to stay out of matters she did not understand. The following day, it was time for my scheduled chemo dose. I prefer taking it in the morning to feel better by evening and sleep more comfortably. However, when I opened the bathroom cabinet, my chemo bottles were missing. Surprised, I asked Emily if she had moved them, but she had not. We searched everywhere, but it was clear they had not just fallen out. We had no children or pets, so there was no reason to hide them. Then Emily recalled that Diana had used the bathroom before leaving the previous day. Given her rant about chemo's toxicity, it dawned on us that Diana might have taken the bottles. Emily was enraged, she stormed out heading straight to Diana's house. When she returned about half an hour later, she was still fuming. Diana had indeed taken my chemo and admitted to throwing it out, believing she was doing me a favor. Diana argued, can you not see he is dying? It is not the cancer, it is those pills. I saved him, you should be thanking me. Due to Diana's interference, I missed a crucial dose of chemo, which is extremely detrimental. I had to see my oncologist immediately. When I explained the situation, he was incredulous. He asked what happened to the chemo he gave me, and I had to tell him the reality of the situation. He looked at me as if I had told him the most absurd story. Nonetheless, he prescribed new bottles and a revised schedule for my treatment. Now we store my medication in a locked cabinet. My wife has vowed that Diana will never set foot in our home again. As I continue my treatment, I am determined to stay focused. Each day brings new challenges, but the turmoil caused by Diana's interference is something we could have never anticipated. The physical toll of chemotherapy is immense, but dealing with Diana's meddling adds a layer of stress that is almost unbearable. A few days after the incident, Diana showed up unannounced at our doorstep. She was clutching a bag filled with various herbs and teas, insisting they were the cure I needed. My wife, seeing red, refused to let her in. Diana stood outside shouting about how we were ungrateful and that I was going to die if I continued the toxic treatment. The commotion drew the attention of our neighbors, adding to the embarrassment and stress. We decided it was time to take action. My wife and I sat down and wrote a formal letter warning Diana to stay away from our home and to stop interfering with my treatment. We hoped this would be enough to deter her, but we underestimated her determination. The next week, while my wife was out running errands, Diana somehow managed to sneak into the house. I was in the bedroom, too weak to get up, when I heard the sound of cupboards opening and closing. By the time I made it to the kitchen, she had already rifled through our medicine cabinet. 
She had taken all the new chemo bottles and was about to leave when I confronted her. She yelled at me, insisting I was killing myself and that she was saving my life. In my weakened state, I could barely argue. She stormed out, taking the medication with her. When my wife returned, she found me distraught and the house in disarray. This was the final straw. We called the police and filed a report. They took our statement and assured us they would handle it. Diana's actions had crossed the line into criminal behavior and we were determined to protect my health and our sanity. The police visited Diana's house and she denied everything, claiming she was only trying to help. However, with our detailed account and previous warnings, they issued her a formal restraining order. Diana was furious and the situation escalated further. She began a campaign against us within the family, painting herself as a concerned mother, only looking out for her son-in-law's best interests, while we were portrayed as ungrateful and stubborn. The stress from these family conflicts started to impact my health more severely. My oncologist noticed the change and advised that I minimize any stressors in my life. My wife decided to cut all communication with her mother, a heartbreaking but necessary decision to ensure my health and safety. This decision was not easy and took a toll on her emotionally. She loved her mother despite everything and hoped that someday there could be reconciliation, but not at the cost of my well-being. Diana was relentless. She began contacting my workplace, spreading lies about my health and claiming that I was a danger to myself and others. She insisted that my mental state was compromised due to the chemotherapy and that I needed to be fired for my own good. This interference jeopardized my sick leave benefits, causing additional stress and financial strain on us. We sought legal advice and were told to gather all evidence of her harassment and to pursue legal action against her. This legal battle for defamation and harassment was draining both emotionally and financially. Each day brought new challenges, and while the legal process moved forward, Diana's antics did not cease. She started sending letters and packages filled with alternative medicines and pamphlets on natural healing to our home. We had to screen our mail and change our phone numbers to prevent her from reaching us. Despite the restraining order, she found ways to bypass legal restrictions, further demonstrating her obsession with controlling my treatment. The emotional toll was immense. We decided to temporarily move to a different location, staying with a trusted friend while we sorted things out. This move, though disruptive, provided a much-needed respite from Diana's relentless harassment. In the safety of our friend's home, we could focus on my treatment without the constant fear of Diana's interference. While staying with our friend, we had time to reflect on our situation. We realized that our primary focus had to be my health and well-being, and that meant taking drastic measures to cut Diana out of our lives completely. My wife decided to send a final clear message to her mother that any further interference would result in severe legal consequences. As we settled into our new temporary home, my health slowly began to improve. The stability and absence of constant stress made a noticeable difference. I could focus on my treatment, follow the doctor's orders meticulously, and even start to regain some strength, but the drama was far from over. Diana, determined as ever, somehow found out where we were staying. She began showing up at our friend's house, demanding to see us. Our friend, a no-nonsense type of person, threatened to call the police if she didn't leave. Diana's desperation was evident. She was losing control, and it was driving her to more erratic behavior. One day, as we were returning from a hospital visit, we found Diana waiting outside our friend's house. She was screaming obscenities, demanding that we listen to her. It was the final straw. Our friend called the police, and this time they took her away for violating the restraining order. We pressed charges, hoping this would be enough to finally end her harassment. The court proceedings were long and grueling. Diana played the victim, insisting she was only trying to help, but the evidence against her was overwhelming. The court ruled in our favor, extending the restraining order and mandating that she undergo psychological evaluation and counseling. It was a small victory in a long, tiring battle. With Diana legally bound to stay away, we finally began to rebuild our lives. We were finally at peace, and my health continued to improve. My wife and I grew closer, our bond strengthened by the trials we had faced together. We resumed our routines, cautiously optimistic about the future. Despite the chaos Diana had caused, we found moments of joy and hope. My health gradually improved, and we started to plan for a future free from her interference. We reconnected with supportive family members and friends who had distanced themselves due to the drama. Their understanding and support provided a much-needed sense of normalcy. Just as we thought things were settling down, a new twist emerged. Diana managed to recruit some extended family members to her cause. They started calling and visiting us, trying to convince us to reconcile with her. Their arguments were filled with guilt-tripping and emotional manipulation, claiming that Diana's actions were out of love and concern. One cousin in particular was relentless. He showed up at our doorstep, insisting that we were tearing the family apart, and that we needed to forgive Diana. 
His aggressive stance was unsettling and added another layer of stress to our already strained lives, overwhelming, and his presence brought back all the stress we had been trying to escape. My wife, fed up with the constant barrage, finally told him off, explaining the extent of Diana's interference and the harm it had caused. But the family pressure did not stop there. Diana's siblings began to take her side, accusing us of being ungrateful and disrespectful. They started spreading rumors within the family, painting us as villains who had turned our backs on Diana in her time of need. The family gatherings we once looked forward to became sources of tension and conflict. We decided to take a more drastic step and move to a different city, seeking a fresh start away from the toxic family dynamics. The move was challenging, but it brought a sense of relief and a chance to rebuild our lives in peace. My health continued to improve in the new environment, free from the constant stress and interference. In our new city, we found a supportive community and began to establish new friendships. My wife found a job she loved, and I continued my treatment with a new medical team. The sense of normalcy and stability was a blessing, and we cherished the quiet moments together. However, the shadow of Diana's actions still lingered. We remained cautious, always on the lookout for any signs of her interference. Despite the distance, she continued to find ways to reach out, using social media and other family members to send messages. We ignored them, focusing on our healing and well-being. One day, we received a letter from Diana, claiming she had changed and was seeking forgiveness. She wrote about her regrets and how she had undergone counseling to understand her actions. My wife and I were skeptical, given the history of manipulation and deceit. We discussed the possibility of reconciliation, but decided it was too soon to trust her words. As my health stabilized, I began to reflect on the journey we had been through. The battles with cancer and Diana's interference had tested us in ways we never imagined, but it also brought us closer, revealing the strength of our bond and our resilience. We learned to prioritize our well-being and to protect our peace, no matter the cost. The journey was far from over, but with each passing day, we moved further away from the chaos Diana had inflicted on our lives. My wife and I vowed to protect our peace and well-being, no matter the cost. We had faced incredible adversity and emerged stronger, ready to face whatever challenges lay ahead together. In the end, this experience reinforced our belief in the power of love and support. We continued to build a life filled with hope and joy, despite the shadows of the past. Our journey taught us the importance of setting boundaries and standing up for ourselves, even in the face of relentless opposition. Update 1 Several months passed, and my health continued to show improvement. The regular chemo sessions, though grueling, were starting to show positive results. The tumors were shrinking, and my energy levels were gradually returning. It felt like we were finally seeing the light at the end of a very long tunnel. Then one day, we received a call from the police. Diana had been arrested for trespassing and harassment. She had been caught sneaking into the hospital where I was receiving treatment, trying to access my medical records. The hospital staff, aware of our situation, had called the authorities. This was the final straw. We decided to press charges, hoping that this would finally put an end to her relentless interference. The court case was intense. Diana once again played the victim, insisting she was only trying to help. But this time, the evidence was overwhelming. The hospital staff testified about her attempts to access my records, and the police presented a history of her harassment. The judge was not sympathetic. Diana was found guilty of harassment and trespassing, and was sentenced to community service and mandatory counseling. The restraining order was extended indefinitely. This legal victory was a significant relief. For the first time in months, we felt a sense of security. We could focus on my recovery without the constant fear of Diana's interference. My wife and I took this opportunity to strengthen our relationship, focusing on the positive aspects of our lives and planning for the future. However, the aftermath of the court case brought new challenges. Diana's actions had caused a rift in the family. Some family members who had previously supported us began to distance themselves, unable to reconcile the image of the loving mother with the reality of her actions. Others continued to support Diana, blaming us for the family's division. This new dynamic was difficult to navigate, but we remained steadfast in our decision to protect our peace. As my health continued to improve, we decided to take a long-awaited vacation. We traveled to a peaceful seaside town, far away from the memories of our recent struggles. The fresh air, the sound of the waves, and the serene environment provided a much-needed respite. We spent our days exploring the town, enjoying the local cuisine, and simply relaxing. It was a time of healing and rejuvenation, a reminder that life could be beautiful despite the challenges. Upon our return, we found that the distance had helped to mend some family relationships. A few relatives reached out, offering apologies and expressing their support. These gestures, though small, were meaningful. We appreciated the efforts to rebuild trust and mend the broken bonds. However, we remained cautious. 
Diana's previous actions had taught us to be vigilant. We maintained the restraining order and continued to screen our mail and calls. Trust, once broken, is difficult to rebuild, and we were determined to protect our newfound peace. As the months turned into a year, my health continued to improve. The cancer was in remission, and I was gradually returning to a semblance of normalcy. My wife and I celebrated this victory with a quiet dinner, reflecting on the journey we had been through. The trials and tribulations had tested us in ways we never imagined, but they had also brought us closer, strengthening our bond and our resolve. Update 2. Just when we thought we had left the worst behind, a new and unexpected challenge emerged. One evening, we received an urgent call from my wife's aunt, who informed us that Diana had suffered a serious health issue and was in the hospital. Despite everything she had done, my wife felt a bit of concern and guilt. Torn between her duty as a daughter and her need to protect our peace, she decided to visit her mother in the hospital. The visit was tense and emotional. Diana, frail and vulnerable, seemed to have softened. She apologized tearfully for her actions, claiming that her fear and misunderstanding had driven her to such extremes. My wife, always compassionate, felt conflicted. Could her mother's remorse be genuine, or was it another ploy to regain control? We decided to proceed cautiously. My wife maintained limited contact with Diana, visiting her occasionally and ensuring she was receiving proper care. However, we made it clear that any further interference in our lives would not be tolerated. Diana seemed to accept these terms, and for a while there was a fragile peace. But as Diana's health improved, so did her old habits. She began to subtly criticize things about me again, albeit in a more subdued manner. My wife and I had to constantly remind her of the boundaries we had set. The stress began to take its toll once more. We realized that the cycle of manipulation was starting again. To find a permanent solution, we sought the help of a family therapist. The therapist worked with us to establish firmer boundaries and provided strategies for dealing with Diana's behavior. It was a challenging process, but it gave us the tools we needed to manage the situation more effectively. Despite these efforts, Diana's behavior continued to fluctuate. Some days, she was contrite and cooperative. Other days, she reverted to her old manipulative tactics. The unpredictability was exhausting, and we had to make a difficult decision. For the sake of my health and our well-being, we chose to cut off contact with Diana completely. The decision was not easy, and it came with a heavy emotional burden. My wife mourned the loss of her relationship with her mother, but she knew it was necessary to protect our peace. We focused on healing and moving forward, building a life free from the chaos that had plagued us for so long. As time passed, the wounds began to heal. We found joy in the small moments, celebrating each milestone and cherishing our time together. My health continued to improve, and we embraced the future with hope and determination.